want to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of James. James chapter 1 is where we're going to be this morning. If uh, you'd go ahead and find that. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab on the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1199 and you will find the book of James. Now, uh, uh, it's way in the back, so you've got to keep looking for it. Uh, don't, don't hesitate thinking you've gone too far. You almost can't go too far to find James. And uh, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you want to read God's Word but you don't uh, have access to one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Now, this is one of my favorite times of the year, one of my favorite weekends of the year, actually, because it starts the season of kind of crazy generosity here at Calvary. And we're always generous, and we love being generous, uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on. First of all, we've got Thanksgiving Eve service, Wednesday, 6 o'clock, communion. It's just a time of celebration and remembering the price that God has paid for our salvation. If you're in town, it's a beautiful service worth being at. Uh, and then today's kind of the day where we're, uh, you know, launching out the, the backpacks for needy kids in uh, communities around us. We've been giving away hundreds of backpacks for probably about 10 years, and, and we just love doing that. We invite you to join with us in doing that, although I heard that uh, we're getting low on backpacks, so you might want to hurry out there after the service and grab some. Uh, we had angel tree uh, angels, but we're out of those, so uh, I apologize. There just aren't enough needy people in our community for us to care for. Isn't that great? So it's kind of awesome. Now, the other thing is the season of generosity, and maybe you're here, and instead of being in a place to bless others, you need a blessing. And, and Pastor Mitch already told you, we're giving out gift cards. So after the service out in the main lobby, if you're in need of some help, just stop by and ask for one. You don't have to fill out any paperwork. You don't have to prove anything. Uh, we just want to bless you if you need blessing. That's our joy, and we love that. Uh, if you know somebody who needs one and they're not here and you want to get a gift card for them, just wait until uh, everybody has a chance to kind of get one that needs one and then uh, go and, and ask for one so that you can be an angel to someone else. Now, in addition to that, we're not the only people that want to bless our community. Uh, uh, only Orchids has told me that they're giving away 2,000 meals for Thanksgiving. Uh, if you want a Thanksgiving meal, you know somebody who needs a Thanksgiving meal. From 8 to noon on Thursday at Chabones, they're giving out Thanksgiving dinners. So they're going to be boxed up. You can go pick them up. So if you need one, get one. If you need 10, get 10. Uh, and take them to somebody who needs them or take somebody down there to get their own. However it works out or if you just want to be lazy and not cook, okay? It's, it's on the table, all right? It's, it's there. So, but this is a great season of generosity. And I hope whether you... Uh, uh, need help or whether you want to help others that you'll step into that and allow God to bless you as you're a blessing or as he blesses you through other people. So have you ever been in a health club or a gym? Who's, who's been to one? I'm not talking about, you know, donating money to them and not going. I'm just talking about showing up. <laughs> uh, have you ever noticed that there is an oddity that uh, pretty much marks every gym or health club I've ever been in that is completely and totally unnecessary to the idea of exercise. I mean, it, it doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever for people who are trying to get in shape or lose weight. You know what I'm talking about? It's that the walls are covered in mirrors, right? How does that help you lose weight? How does that help you get in shape? The fact that there's mirrors on the walls doesn't do anything at all. I guess if you're, you know, in good shape and you're looking at yourself working out, it's like, yeah, I look good. I can see myself looking at myself, working on myself. It's good. Or, or maybe if you're like me and you go in there and you go, oh, man, I really need to work out. You know, now look at that. Look at that slob there in the mirror. I need to do something about that. So, so either way, it's going to be affirmation or it's going to be conviction when you see it. Okay. Another confession, how many of you hate having your picture taken? Okay, every service, a lot of hands go up, uh, and uh, it's interesting. Why do we hate having our picture taken? Because we don't like how we look, or we don't want to see how we actually look. And, and, and denial is a real thing, isn't it? We, you know, we're real, really not enamored with that, that representation of us. And... Uh, uh, Years ago, our church used to do this thing called pictorial directories. And a company would come in and take everybody's picture and then put them into a book for us uh, with, you know, names and addresses. And it really served a great, you know, purpose because then when you and your wife are arguing about, you know, who somebody is and are trying to describe them, and, uh, and you're like, you just, you just open it up and point to the picture and go, oh, that's who you're talking about. 
Now you have to do it on Facebook, right? And, uh, and, and so, but we used to do these pictorial directories and the company would come in and they're trying to sell photographs. So to give everybody a free photo, you come in and, and take pictures and sit down with them and they're trying to sell you pictures of your family. And, uh, and it was a great thing, but they had these rules. They had the rules where, you know, you had to, you know, if you wanted a free photo, you had to sit down and listen to them sell you on photos because they wanted to make money. And secondly, you couldn't bring your own photos for the pictorial directory. You know, no outside photos allowed. And I thought, you know, hey, that's kind of a lousy rule because I'm, I'm a rule breaker anyway. And so we said, oh, you know, if you're out of town or if you're too ill to get there, you can send us a photo so we have it. And that was a huge mistake. Can I tell you, there's, there's another reason I have that rule, and that is because people are deep in denial. We had, God bless them, some nice, sweet little old ladies that would come in with their photo and say, I can't be here for the photo shoot, but here's a photo of me. And seriously, it was a 30-year-old gl glamour shot. <laughs> and I'm like, that's not you. Oh, yes, it's me. That's not you now. Okay, can we have one that represents who you are today, not like three decades ago? Because that's not, and, and that's when it, it struck me that, you know, self-deception is really not your friend. So the next time you look at a photograph and say or wonder, does that really look like me? Yes, it does. Okay? That's what you look like. That's why it's a photo. Unless somebody's photoshopped it or something. That's you. It really is you. And, and I know a lot of you are really harsh because you, you, when you look at the photograph, you don't actually see what you look like. You see your, you know, judgmental version of what you think you look like. Uh, and that's a whole other sermon. I don't have time to preach that today. But, but here's the thing. Self-denial, self-deception is not your friend. It's not going to bless you. It's not going to help you. God calls us into truth. Even truth about us. Especially truth about us. So can I tell you a couple of realities? Uh, truth is, you're not as good as you'd like to be. Not one of us in this room are as good as we'd like to be. As the person that we'd like to post on Facebook and, and share with the world that, that this is how good we, and wonderful our life is, we're not as good as that. But you're also not as bad as you think you are or fear that you are. You're really not as bad as you think. You know, you, maybe you're embarrassed by your past or your failures or the struggles that you've had, and, and you're just thinking, wow, I'm, I'm nowhere near as good as anybody else. No, that's not true. That's not true. You're not as good as you think, as you'd like to be. You're not as bad as you think you are. The truth is, we're all sinners in desperate need of God's grace. All of us are in the same place. We're all in the same boat. Uh, we're in this together, and we're all failures that need God's love and mercy. Now, the good news is, God has poured out His grace on us. God loves us, and He's forgiven us in Jesus Christ. The fact that He sacrificed Jesus for us, for your sins and my sins, tells us how valuable we are to Him. So today, as we continue our series on the core values here at Calvary, we're examining character. Character. Uh, because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. If you've been coming here a while, you've heard me say that a lot. Uh, and, and one of the problems is that as the church in general, we've tried to represent Jesus, we've tried to speak for Jesus without representing his character. And, and what that does is it discredits Jesus. James chapter 1, uh, I'm just going to read a short passage, verses 22 through 25. Uh, but it's, it's a hard passage to listen to. I want you to hear this because it's written by Jesus' brother, half-brother, James the Apostle. And he says this, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Be doers of the word and not hearers only and deceive yourselves. God's word is a mirror. It allows us to see us as who we are. And sometimes that mirror of God's word is affirming, and sometimes it's convicting. Sometimes it tells us what we want to hear, and sometimes it challenges how we're living our lives. God's word is also a snapshot. It's a picture of how we're doing at the moment. It reveals what our character really looks like. And yes, it's a true picture. 
So today what I want to do is simply hold up the mirror of God's word to you and allow you to see who you are before God. Allow you to see your character, see yourself before God. And, and what I'm hoping happens is that you have a conversation with God about your character. That you do some evaluation of where you are in this walk with God and, and kind of figure out where you can hear Jesus saying, well done, and where you can hear him saying, you need to change. And my hope and prayer is that at the end of this, you'll invite God to change your life because that's what he wants to do. Now, just uh, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask five questions. Uh, and these questions are the ones that I want you to have a conversation with God about. But understand, these questions are for your evaluation because they're going to reflect and reveal your character. They're not for you to evaluate the character of the person sitting next to you. Okay, you're not to nudge them, look at them, say, hey, the sermon's for you. Uh, because it's for each one of us. Because if you're a follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit's in you and he wants to teach you, uh, and so this is a mirror for you. So here we go. First question. Which do you value more, the gift or the giver? Which do you value more, the gift or the giver? Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The great commandment begins, love God. Love God. And, and it's so easy to love God, isn't it? He's given us life. He's forgiven our sins. He's promised us heaven. He's blessed us tremendously. I hope you can see your blessings. It's Thanksgiving week. I hope you can really understand how blessed you are as a follower of Jesus. But if we're honest, sometimes we get more excited about the gifts that God gives us than we do about God himself. Uh, you ever been there when you gave a gift that was a disappointment to somebody? I do it all the time because I'm married. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I fail at gift buying, okay? It's just not my language. So, uh, but, you know, when I give a gift that, that uh, my wife's not really thrilled with, she still loves me, and I know that. I'm way more important than the gifts that I give. But have you been there when there was somebody that you gave a gift to that was completely and totally ungrateful? for the gift, and they looked at it and went, eh, whatever. And they didn't care, and they treated you with contempt, disgust, dismay, they just ignored you. That's a terrible feeling when you realize that the gift is more important than the giver. So how do you respond when God doesn't answer your prayers? How do you respond when, you know, life seems to go wrong even when you're trying to follow Jesus? How do you respond when God doesn't bless you like you were hoping to be blessed. You know, you were hoping for that promotion and you didn't get it. You were hoping for the good medical report and you didn't get it. You were hoping that your kids were going to come home for the holidays and they're not. Or how do you respond when tragedy strikes your life? Because all of us have been broken by life. All of us have experienced tragedies. What's your default at that moment? See, we all love the blessings of God, but do you love God when it feels like he's not blessing you? In the Bible, there's a story of this man named Job. Uh, if you're familiar with Scripture, if you grew up in church, you probably know this, a little bit about the story of Job. If you're new to this Christian thing, then you're probably wondering why there's a book in the Bible called Job. Because that's how it's spelled, J-O-B. And I used to think, why is there a book called Job and it doesn't even have any jobs listed in there? So, story of Job, it's actually the oldest uh, book in the Bible uh, and the earliest one written. And so here's the story. Job was a righteous man, and God had blessed Job tremendously. And one day Satan comes to God and he says, uh, Hey, Job just loves you because uh, you blessed him. And God says, No, he just loves me, period. Not because I blessed him. And Satan says, Well, then let me torment Job. Let me just take everything away from him and crush his life, and then he'll curse you. And God says... Take your best shot. Just don't kill him. And Satan does. Job is wealthy, and in one day, all of his wealth is taken away. His herds are raided and stolen. His crops are destroyed. He loses all of his wealth. He's got a family. He's got a bun bunch of kids, and, and the house collapses on him and kills them all. Job gets sick. He gets boils all over his body, kind of like shingles, only worse, and, and he's suffering. His wife, the encourager that she has, comes to him and says, Job, curse God and die. 
kind of like her to be a little more supportive. <laughs> Scripture says Job has these friends, and these friends come to Job in his time of need. And we don't need friends like these, I'm just telling you, because they come to Job and say, Job, obviously you did something wrong. You got some secret sin. You need to repent and confess it. Job says, I, I didn't do anything, because he didn't do anything. And they just keep arguing with him and telling him how, how big of a sinner he must be because uh, he's suffering. And, and here's what Job says. Chapter 1, uh, toward the end of the chapter, he says, The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's an incredible statement because Job loved God more than he loved God's blessings. Is your praise based on your circumstances or on your love for God? Which do you value more, the gift or the giver? It's a question of character. Second question, how quickly do you lose your temper? James chapter 1, a couple verses before the ones I already read, verse 19 and 20. The apostle says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There's a lot of us that probably ought to copy that down and put it all over our house, right? A lot of us. How quickly do you lose your temper? Because anger is so revealing and it's so difficult to hide. 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul, a great love chapter, verse 4, he begins the description of love by this one phrase, love is, do you guys know what it is? Patient. Love is patient. James challenges us to listen, to be slow to speak, to be slow to anger, because anger doesn't do anything for God's kingdom. It doesn't help. So how easily are you actually provoked to anger? How easily are you provoked to anger with your spouse? Do you blow up at them? You yell at them, I can't believe you did that again. What are you thinking? How easily do you get provoked to anger with your kids? If you have kids at home, are you yelling and screaming at them all the time? How easily do you get provoked to anger in traffic? Hey, the, right, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness that God desires, right? You're, he just told you that. So it's not going to produce righteousness if you go off on road rage. It's just not going to help. How easily do you get provoked to anger when you're watching the news? Really? Is you getting angry about current events really going to bless the kingdom of God? Are you getting angry at people who disagree with you about current events. That's not going to bless the kingdom of God. Uh, God is teaching all of us patience. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit of God in you is trying to teach you patience. Uh, I know this because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's a required course for us. In other words, you don't get to audit it. You don't get to skip it. You can't just, you know, not take it. It's required for everyone who's a follower of Jesus. The, the Spirit in you is trying to teach you patience. You might as well go ahead and learn because love is patient. So are we going to make excuses? Well, you know, it's my ancestry. I can't help it. I'm Italian. I'm Mexican. I'm Irish. I'm Scottish. Really? Are you going to blame your circumstances? Oh, you know, the people I work with, they just they set me off. Are you going to blame your stress? Oh, i got to get it out, otherwise it'll kill me. Are we going to make excuses or are we going to repent? It's a question of character. Third question. Are your words bitter or encouraging? Are your words bitter or encouraging? If you'll turn your Bibles over one page to James chapter 3... Verses 9 and 10. Actually, the, the first part of chapter 3 is this great statement. on. I can't even turn one page. You guys are all watching me just like struggle to turn one page. James chapter 3 is this great discussion about the tongue and how we use our words. But just listen to the end of this, 9 and 10. James says, With our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. 
He goes on to s compare it to a, a spring of water. Does it produce both you know, good water and bad water? No, it doesn't. So praise or cursing? Because he says if both are happening, something's wrong. We are called by God to build others up with our words. I literally could take the rest of the hour and just read scripture verses about the tongue, about our words, about how we're to use them. So do your words encourage your spouse? Or do you only point out the flaws and failures again and again? Do your words encourage your children or your grandchildren? Parents, can I just tell you that your words have an impact that lasts generations, oftentimes? I know this because uh, uh, one of the things, I've talked to my mom about this, but when I was growing up, uh, I had three brothers and I was the lazy one. I know I was the lazy one because I was told by my parents that over and over and over again. You're lazy. You know why they call me lazy? Because I like to play. It's kind of so weird for kids to like to play, right? So I just wanted to make work fun. I got in trouble for making work fun, so I was the lazy one. And so here's what impact that had on me. The first 10 years that I was the pastor at Calvary, I never took a day off if I was in town. 10 years, I almost burned out. By the way, that's ungodly because, you know, Scripture talks about taking a Sabbath, a rest. I didn't do that. It wasn't healthy. I finally came to that point of repentance. But you know what I realized? I realized that every time I wanted to take time off, there was an accusation in the back of my head saying, lazy. You're lazy. You're lazy. And I had to deal with that. And I'd come to grips with it. it was a lie, that a curse that had been placed on me by my parents. They didn't mean to. They loved me. They blessed me in so many ways. So our words are so powerful. They're going to shape lives. They're going to impact. So are your words building up? Are they tearing down? Are they bitter or are they encouraging? Look at James 1.26. And, and, and let these words of this verse sink in, because this is, this is kind of scary. I don't know how else to put it. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Wow. If anyone thinks that he is a person of faith, a person who's following Jesus, a Christian, and does not control his tongue, he's deceiving his heart, his faith is worthless. So let me challenge you at this point. Are you aware of your words? Really, honestly, are you aware of your words? Because um, what I'd really challenge you to do is have a difficult and honest conversation with your spouse, with your family, with the people close to you in your life to talk about your words. And you need to ask them, hey, are my words bitter or are they encouraging? And don't defend yourself. Just listen to their, their feedback. You may even want to give them permission to like tape record you when you're talking. So you can hear yourself. Like I did with my wife when she was snoring. Uh, so, uh, hey, it just settled an argument. That's all. So all I had to do was hit play. It was all good. Uh, so, uh, but we need to go ahead and... and Ask for that feedback so that we can be accountable for our words. We need help. Here's the thing. If we're not intentional about this, uh, if, we don't, if we don't go ahead and apologize and repent and say, hey, I want to do better and I want you to tell me when I'm doing better and when I'm not, then uh, we're never going to get better. We're not going to change unless there is that intentionality of change. So are your words bitter or encouraging? Because it's a question of character. Fourth question, how do you treat the people who serve you? How do you treat the people who serve you? Let's finish off the Mark 12 conversation with Jesus. He started with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and great commandment. He says the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. That's pretty significant. He says, these are the big two. No other commandment greater than these. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So how do you treat the people who are serving you in life? We're talking about the wait staff, the retail store clerks, the medical office staff or the people at the hospital, the government workers, the first responders, the people who cut your hair or, you know, pull your weeds. How are you treating them? 
And what does it look like to love your neighbor? Okay, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. The Apostle Paul finished that phrase, love is patient, love is kind. It's kind. So if we're going to love our neighbors, if we're going to uh, love the people who are serving us, then we need to be kind. So when people are serving you, do you see them as people created in God's image? Therefore, they are deserving of respect. In other words, if you look at your servers and, and you go, wow, they're made in the image of God, then you will respect them. One of the reasons that our society is hurtling towards self-destruction is because we have dismissed this idea of God in our common vocabulary, and therefore we're not referring to people as made in the image of God, and therefore if they're not made in the image of God, they don't, you don't owe them any respect or dignity. But we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are going to be light in this darkness, and we're going to treat people with respect. Why? Because... They're created in the image of God. They are deserving simply because they draw breath, even before they draw breath. They are deserving of dignity and respect and life. So when people are serving you, do you see them as people who are loved by Jesus, therefore deserving an invitation to the life-changing power of God? In other words, when you look at the people who are serving you, do you go, wow, Jesus loves them and he died on the cross for their sins just like he died on the cross for my sins. Therefore, I need to you know, be inviting them to this life-changing power of Jesus. This is about our calling. We talked about this last week, that, that we're called to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And, and so here, here's the reality. If you see them as somebody that Jesus loves enough to die for, it's going to change the way you think about them. And you're going to realize that every single encounter that you have with people is a God-ordained moment for you to speak into their lives, for you to love their lives in the same way that Jesus loved them so that you might share the gospel with them. It doesn't matter if they're the wait staff in a restaurant or the medical staff when you're hurting or if it's the first responder who pulled you over because you were driving too fast. They are deserving of kindness and respect. Why? Because it's our witness. We are representing Jesus Christ to them in that moment. So are we treating them with that, that love of Jesus as he poured out on us that, that they want to be invited to that life-changing power of God. When they're serving you, do you see them as people who've been broken by this world in the same way that you've been broken by this world? Therefore, deserving of compassion and mercy and prayer. Hey, try this. The next time that they get your order wrong for the eighth time, instead of getting irritated, why don't you pray for them? They're obviously not having a good moment. Next time they make you wait in the doctor's office, 10 times longer than, than you expected to? Why don't you pray for them because they're having a tough time. Maybe someone's having a real tough time. You see, it's, it's about our attitude. So how do you treat the people who are serving you? If we want to represent Jesus, we need to bless people while they serve us. Kindness always. You know, mercy and compassion always. Affirmation, if it's possible. Okay, if, if someone is, is doing a terrible job, you can't affirm them in that. But if they're doing a good job, then affirm them. And when we tip, if tips are involved, can I just ask you to do something? Can you tip for Jesus and not for service? Can, I mean, seriously. I mean, some of you are like tipping for, for service. And what that means is, hey, I'm going to judge you on your performance and I'm going to reward you accordingly. We're people of mercy. Do you really want to be known as, hey, that's that Christian who's cheap. That's that stingy church group. Hey, Jesus must be a jerk because the people who follow him sure are. I, I mean, seriously, you're putting Jesus' reputation on the line for a couple of bucks? I mean, are, are we not thinking this through? We are there representing Jesus Christ. Let's tip for Jesus, not for service. I mean, if they, if they were really great on the service, then give them more, okay? Okay. Let's just go ahead and do that because we care more about our Christian testimony, about representing Jesus to this world, than we do about a couple of dollars. And if you can't do that, you're like, oh, I just can't do it. I got a tip for service. I don't care what. Then just only eat at McDonald's, okay? <laughs> don't go someplace that requires tipping. Or you just pick up the check and let everybody else tip and tell them to be generous. I don't know. Look, that's what Jesus' character looks like. What does our character look like? Last question. 
Do you want to give more or less? Do you want to give more or less? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves can break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart's going to be also. Where your treasure is is where your heart is going to be. So do you want to give more or do you want to give less? Because God is generous. I mean, God has given us every good thing in life. God has given us Jesus. He sacrificed his son for you and for me. He allowed him to bleed and die and, and be embarrassed and humiliated and suffer terrible pain so that we could have life. That's God being generous. So are you going to choose to be generous? I, I mean, do you see your role as a steward and caretaker of everything that God's blessed you with? Uh, so this is one of those revealing questions. Do you want to give more or do you want to keep more for yourself? Now, I know, we all know the church-appropriate answer. We could all, you know, you could all lie to me. You could tell me what I wanted to hear. But here's the thing. I'm not the one who's holding you accountable. God knows you. God loves you. But God knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you truly want. And he knows that greed is alive and well in every single one of us. And, and, and if you're like me, you have to do a battle with greed at, at that point of generosity. You, you, you know, and greed, by the way, is just selfishness applied to money and things. That's all it is. Just us being selfish with money and things. And we want more for us. And God's antidote to greed. Because greed will kill you. Greed will destroy you, destroy your family, destroy your friends, destroy everything. God's antidote to greed is generosity. He says the more you want to keep it, then the more you want to give it away. You can overcome that, that selfishness by sharing it. So, so when we announce about the backpack things, saying, hey, you can pick up a backpack and you can bless people with it and fill out for the needy and the communities around us, um, do you get excited or do you grieve? Are you like, oh, this is so awesome. I, I want to go get backpacks and I'm going to get them for my grandkids. And we're going to go shopping together and we're going to fill them up and we're going to bring them back. It's going to be so good. I'm going to get backpacks for my kids and let them pick and they're, they're going to go out and pick the toys out. and things. Do you get excited or do you go like, oh, rats. They're asking for us to do this again. I hate that. How do I get out of here without looking like I'm cheap? How can I get to my car so people can't see me not carrying a backpack because I don't really want to fill out one of the stupid backpacks for these kids again? Hey, we're honest. So now let's just go ahead and put it on the table because God knows our hearts anyway. There's some of us who are having those, those kind of thoughts. I don't want to do that. Now, there's some of you who aren't going to get a backpack and you're generous like crazy and you're giving to all kinds of things and the Spirit hasn't told you you need to go get a backpack because you're already generous. That's great. But there's some of you that are like, I don't want to do that. You really don't want to share. You really don't want to go out of your way to bless someone else. And that's a heart issue, and you got to struggle with that. Because what we're talking about do we, is this, on generosity, are we going to step up to the plate or are we going to walk away? And it doesn't just relate to backpacks. It relates to life and blessing people and helping people. It really is a question of character. So today what we're inviting you to do is simply to be honest with yourself and with Jesus. Regardless of how you answer those questions, God loves you. Jesus died for you. Your sins are forgiven. You're included in his family forever. And, and get this, God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He just wants you to make progress. So will you invite Jesus to change your character? specifically at different points. And what I hope you do is I hope you go home and you look at those questions again and you look at those scriptures again and you and the Holy Spirit will have a conversation about your life. Now, one last question. If you're really being honest, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Have you come to that place where you've acknowledged that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Because if you haven't done that, then all this talk about character doesn't matter. 
Because it doesn't matter how good or bad you are, your destiny is hell. And Jesus wants to forgive you. Jesus wants to change your life. And we want to see you step into that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ more than anything else. So if you haven't made that decision, then please make it today. Talk to the members of the prayer team. Find one of the pastors. Uh, declare your faith in baptism so that people know that you're an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ because he wants to give you life unending. But for all of us, I pray that we choose to surrender to Jesus because he's the God who will change your life. Will you pray with me?